I'm in the UK now, I have to use the two words differently. <laughs> Certainly, um, you feel it here. And you have this image that there are these emerging nations that have, are the beneficiaries of globalization. And China and India particularly are these beneficiaries of globalization. Why? Because, well, first of all, they've had rapid rates of growth. There's this little competition now, which one grows faster in each quarter. Is China growing at 7.1%? Is India growing at 7.2%? This kind of nonsense. But it's also true that they've had sustained rates of growth now. Nearly two and a half, three decades in the case of India, and almost four decades in the case of China, of significantly more rapid growth than the rest of the world. The absence of major financial crises, because you've had other parts of the global economy, Latin America, say, that's grown very rapidly for, let's say, seven, eight years, and then has a big crisis and collapses, and then you have to pick up all the pieces. China and India, we have not had major crises, and we've had a significant reduction in income poverty. This is the thing that everybody talks about the most, you know, that we have brought, uh, China has brought, you know, really half the population out of poverty. Um, India has brought a very significant proportion, hundreds of millions also out of poverty over this three decade period. So clearly, there are these many successes. And it's also this tendency to treat China and India as similar, somehow, you know. Uh, from a distance, everything looks the same. We don't look the same. In fact, we look quite different, even inside our countries. Uh, but there's a tendency to say, well, you know, they're broadly similar in all of these respects. And so you can kind of think of them in a similar way. Uh, there was even this horrible term coined at some point, Chindia. I don't know if you know. <laughs> then you said, oh, yes, you know, that lot. All those Asians doing dynamic things and so on. <laughs> um, but, in fact, there are really very crucial differences between them. And in, in many ways, the similarities are quite superficial. So let me just identify some of the big, obvious differences. I mean, the most obvious difference is in the institutional conditions of the life. India, while we were a, a mixed economy, okay, with a large private sector, of course, but fundamentally, the post-independence trajectory was a capitalist trajectory with some role of the state. Everyone seems to kind of think of India, you know, the planned economy part of India as the same as Chinese socialist planning. It was very different. It was a state trying to control a, uh, a public sector that it could not control, in a sense. But it, it did have lots of rules and regulations and so on. Uh, but it, because it was essentially a capitalist economy, it had fundamentally this tendency to involuntary unemployment. It had a demand constraint throughout most of its period, even of the dirigist regime, you know, the planned regime, and subsequently as well. China, on the other hand, as you know, mostly a command economy. And even until quite recently, until about 10 years ago, it had a very small private sector. There was still, even today, substantial state control over the major macroeconomic processes. And these differ, therefore, from conventional macroeconomic policy, because there are many ways in which the Chinese state is able to control the economy beyond the standard fiscal policy, monetary policy. It controls finance, it controls a large number of enterprises, and it is therefore able to influence levels of economic activity in different ways. Then, of course, the obvious point, right? India is a multi-party electoral democracy with a sort of federal structure. China is a one-party state with still strong centralized control. I have to tell you that centralization is growing in India as well, and there are questions about democracy. Not just today, today there are real questions about our democracy, but they have been for some time, because it's, many have argued that it is an electoral democracy, but not necessarily a substantive democracy in terms of delivering social and economic, and even civil and political rights of different sections of the people. But then, of course, there's the, the basic story, and that's, if you like, the sad part for Indians to tell, which is that there's no comparison in terms of growth and investment, okay? The Chinese economy grew at between 8 to 10 percent per year for three decades, okay? It slowed down. Now it's a big slowdown, and everybody says, oh my god, it's slowing down to 6.5 percent. <laughs> okay, so in India we grew in the 80s at about 55 to 6 percent. In the 90s, at about, sorry, at the 90s, at about 5 to 6 percent. 
in the 2000s at about 8 to 9 percent, and now we are growing at about 7 percent, slightly under if, in fact, we really judge our GDP data properly. And why is there such a big difference in the growth rates? Well, basically, China is investing massively, okay? The Chinese investment rate is the historically the highest investment rate over such a prolonged period that we have ever seen. Okay? Investing between 35 to 45 percent of income, nearly half of the income every year being invested. Can you imagine? Over three decades. I mean, this is historically unprecedented. The only two periods we have of higher than 40 percent investment rate for one country continuously, it's the, it's the Soviet Union under Stalin, it's Indonesia under Suharto. And we know what happened in both those cases. Here in China, you have three decades of this massive, massive investment push. So in a sense, it would be crazy if it didn't grow so fast. The you know, question is, how does it even generate that kind of investment? In India, we've had 24 to 34, which is like developing country average. It's nothing special, really. It's been falling. For the last four years, investment rates have been falling. We are now down to less than 30%. So in a way, it's not so surprising that the growth rates have been, in that sense, lower. But particularly, the difference shows in infrastructure. The China has invested a uh, one-fifth of its GDP in infrastructure for these last 30 years. One-fifth, 20% of GDP just on infrastructure. That's why those of you who travel to China will find everything is new and shiny and big and massive and you know, really impressive. In India, 2%. <laughs> so if you can again understand why when you go to India, things are crumbling, the infrastructure is a mess, the ports are clogged and, and the streets are congested and, and so on and so forth. It, it kind of follows. And this is reflected also in the share of world GDP. Now, I don't know how clear this is, but the red line is China. And as you can see, it's just gone up massively. This is not in PPP exchange rates, not in purchasing power parity exchange rates, because in fact, I will come to that. I don't think that's a good, accurate picture. This is in 2005 constant US dollars. But even in those terms, you see that China has just exploded in terms of its share of global GDP. Okay? India's also increased, but it was absolutely stagnant for a very long time, and then it's increased a little bit. Okay? But the other story, the story that's worth noting, and as I said, for India, a bit depressing to see, is that this series begins in 1960. And that you will see that in 1960, India's per capita income was higher than China's. Okay? This is the Chinese as a proportion of India's per capita income. It's less than one in the 1960s. And it gradually increases to the point where it is now four times India's. So it's really the last three decades that has defined not only China's massive rise, but the fact that it has way outstripped India, even although India is seen as an equally successful story. Well, perhaps not equally. I mentioned a little just now that PPP exchange rates are not the best way of looking at things. What does that mean? Uh, those of you who are not familiar with purchasing power parity exchange rates, it's basically a measure that is used, uh, first elaborated by Heston and Summers, now the World Bank uses it, and now everybody uses it, which uh, says that the nominal exchange rate, the market exchange rate, is not a good indication, because I can buy more for 65 rupees in India than I can buy with a dollar in the US. Or I can buy more for 85 rupees in India uh, than I can buy with, with a pound in England. In fact, it used to be 100 rupees not, not so long ago. Um, which is an accurate point. But essentially, the problem is that the reason why I can buy more in India is because there are lots of really low-wage people who are selling their goods and services very, very cheaply. And therefore, I can access cheap goods and services. So if I say, well, you know, you're actually quite rich because you think you're poor, but then you get really good goods and services from other poor people. Do you see how this is kind of double whammy? You are being told that you're not as poor as you think you are because of the fact that there are other poor people, even worse off than you, who are giving you goods and services very, very cheaply. And of course, the other problem is that global trade, investment, and so on, don't actually use PPP exchange rates. I would love it if they did, right? I could exchange the rupee at 12 rupees a dollar instead of 65. But 
Since global trade and investment and financial flows and everybody else uses market exchange rates, and these economies, like all of us, are more and more integrated into these global flows, these are really what matter, in a sense. This is just giving you how different this looks. The left side is uh, China, and as you can see, the red line is the PPP uh, income. The green line per capita income, the green line is the uh, market exchange rate income. So when you look at the market exchange rate income, it's still a very impressive performance, but certainly not crazy impressive the way it is now. This matters also geopolitically, because PPP exchange rates are used everything. They're used in WTO, they're used in Paris COP, and the, you know, the agreements that are all international agreements, everybody uses PPP to suggest that well, you, know, you can afford to do it now, because you're so much richer. Okay, trade patterns. Again, no comparison. China, very rapid export growth, that one everybody knows. Aggressive increases of world market shares, and it was really based on a remarkable strategy of using relocated capital that was attracted by cheap labor, good infrastructure, heavily subsidized infrastructure, in fact, as we've seen, uh, to enable a massive expansion of trade. So, to the point where it has become a crucial pole of demand for the entire developing world, it's almost everybody's largest trading partner today. Okay? raw material, intermediate goods, everything. So China has become a very major force in terms of global trade. In India, no. We, everyone thinks that we are the global office and China is the global factory and all of that, in the, the most journalistic places. That's not true either, okay? We've had a much lower rate of export growth. Despite our cheap labor, because of poor infrastructure, because of poor nutrition, because of poor education, it's not necessarily that they are more profitable. And so, Exports haven't really become this engine of growth. Okay? In a limited extent, services, yes, have played a role, but that's not as much of a difference as people actually think, and I will come to that in the Indian case in a minute. So just to give you an indication of the significance of world trade, the column on the left is the share of world exports, and the first set of columns is the US. Okay? The second set of columns and the years that I'm looking at are 1995 and 2015. Okay, so this is how it's changed. So the US has gone up a little bit in the share of world trade, but look at China, global exports, and look at India. That's the third set of columns. Okay, the second set of columns the, on the right hand side is the share of world imports, and that's also very important. And you can see that the U.S. is declining in its share of global imports. That's very significant. It is less and less important as the ultimate market for an entire range of countries, especially developing countries. But China is growing very significantly in its share of global imports. It's a very rapid increase. India, too, is growing in its share of global imports. But it's still much, much smaller than China. So the impact on the rest of the world is that much less. A very big difference is in the financial sector. In a sense, our financial sector in India was typical of that sort of mixed economy. We did not, everyone talks about the nationalized banks and so on, and it's true, we have nationalized banks. Uh, in 1969, they were nationalized, and uh, despite some privatization, then about 65% of banking in India is still state-owned. Uh, but despite that, it was nonetheless Typical of a mixed economy, we still had significant non-bank financial institutions. We were still not really able to control financial flows quite in the same way. And of course, since the 1990s, we've had financial liberalization, internal and external, which has significantly reduced control over financial allocations. <coughs> in China, on the other hand, even today, dominant financial transactions are still under the control of the state. There are four public sector banks that account for about 80 to 85 percent of all transactions in the economy. So when I told you they can use other levers, this is a very important lever you can use. When you want to increase economic activity, you get the banks to actually increase credit. When you want to bring it down, you reduce the volume of credit. And you can actually regulate various things. Um, 
and you can deliver credit to the sectors that you want to encourage. That's very important in an industrialization strategy. Actually, no country in the world has industrialized without delivery credit. So this is a very important tool that it has. But it is true that even China in the last decade, and specifically after 2009, has done quite a bit of financial liberalization. Uh, a lot of increase in shadow banking, which has now come to dominate a significant part of real estate and construction and other lending. And uh, it's also intervened in terms of you know, stock market activity, which is heavily leveraged also through shadow banks, through basically banks that are falling through regulatory cracks. But in a way, all of this is the background for what I see as the fundamental difference in terms of economic development between China and India. China had what you might call the classic pattern. It moves, you know, the, the classic who's next clerk, you know, Lewis kind of moving from primary to manufacturing and then to services. Manufacturing doubled its share of the workforce and tripled its share of the output over the period of, you know, dramatic industrialization. In India, on the other hand, we haven't really done that. Insofar as employment has changed, it's changed from agriculture to a little bit services, but not that much. Share manufacturing hasn't changed much either in output or in employment. The primary sector, that's agriculture, fisheries, and you know, all of those related things, it fell from 65% of GDP to 25% in four decades, but the share of employment in the primary sector is still around 60%. Just to give you an indication of what good structural change looks like. This is South Korea, it's the sort of classic uh, next style structural change. Um, and the green line going upwards um, from, oh god, everything's green and blue, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the green line going up is per capita GDP. So you can see that that goes up nicely all through, okay? The, uh, oh heavens, the blue upper. The upper aquamarine line coming down. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the share of agriculture in output. Okay, and as you can see, that's, sorry, in employment. That's the share of agriculture and employment coming down from about 65 to less than 10%. That's precisely what you want. That's what all the European countries did, the US did, Japan did, Canada did, etc., etc. That's what South Korea also did. The lower, darker blue line is the share of the primary sector in an output. And that too has come down. So it's fine, no, less output as a share, but much less employment as a share. So in fact, what is happening is that the agriculture itself became more productive. Then you look at the other, oh dear, green lines again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the sort of darker green line going continuously upwards is the share of manufacturing in output. So here's a country that's industrializing. The share of manufacturing in output keeps increasing. The brighter green line that goes up and then comes down is the share of manufacturing in employment. And that's precisely what all of the classic you know, structural change development economists were wanting. They wanted the share of manufacturing to go up for a while and then come down because manufacturing gets more and more productive. And that gap between the output and employment shares releases all this labor to go into services. So that by the end of this process of development, as in the UK, most of your workforce is in services. Most of those, the South Korean workforce is in services, and so on. Okay, that's the classic development pattern. And as you can see, the Chinese pattern is kind of on that who's next path. It's not as dramatic and sharp, but it's broadly happening. The shares, oh, I really goofed on these colors, I'm so sorry. Everything looks red, right? Anyway, the dark brown thing coming down is the share of agriculture and employment. The, the reddish one coming down, the share of agriculture and output. Both coming down nicely. Not yet enough, but you can see that the trajectory is the right one. The share of manufacturing uh, in employment and output are the two lines in between. And what's remarkable about this is that it's really high. These are really high shares. Okay? 40% of output and about 25% of, of employment. So yes, it has become an industrializing economy, very much on that route. India, oops. The top aquamarine line again is the share of the primary sector in employment. And it practically doesn't budge. 
it really barely changes. Huh? It's still above 55 percent, which is ridiculous, crazy. Okay. Whereas the share of the primary in output keeps coming down. That's the blue line that is coming down so much, right? Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that most of the workforce is stuck in low productivity agriculture. So it's a real failure of structural change. And that failure is evident in the two aquamarine and green lines at the bottom, which are the share of manufacturing in output, the higher one, and in employment, the lower one. Nothing, no change. Now, what's really significant about this is that this persists, this is from 1960 onwards, this pattern persists through the so-called Nehruvian planning, deregist, etc. period. It persists through the period of market-oriented reforms. It persists through the neoliberal period. In other words, whichever regime you have will not get you structural change. It's a very weird pattern there. I have not found such a peculiar pattern in any other economy. So there are more examples of weirdness we will come to, but this is certainly one of them. I would argue that this absence of structural change is in a sense the underlying basis for all the other stuff that we can see. You know, the poverty reduction, the human development indicators and all of those things. It may be excessively economic determinist, but it is a fact that if you cannot move people out of low productivity activities, your aggregate workforce is not going to be better off in that sense. And that's unfortunately the case. We now, in China, have a massive <coughs> excess of poverty reduction. Around 4% of the population now lives under the poverty line. Unofficially, maybe 12%, okay? But still, really much, much lower, okay? I have to say that this is also a reflection of other changes that happened in China well before this reform period, which are critical for enabling the success of the reform period. The revolution and the subsequent land reform, the, the redistribution of all other assets, the creation of a very large mass market, all of these things actually played a very important role in the success of the reforms. And we can't forget that. It also, by the way, played a huge role in changing social relations. And um, it created, therefore, a society with much fewer social divisions, much less of the, um, shall I say, the forms of social discrimination and exclusion that have really been holding the Indian economy back in many ways. Okay? And of course, also in China, we know that there's there was extensive provision of public health and education, public services for you know, health, nutrition, sanitation, and all of those things. It's true that from the 1990s, there were higher fees and commercialization. And in fact, particularly for middle schools, that reduced access and was in the indicators. But since 2012, there's been a revival of public spending, especially in health. And that has, once again, improved a lot of those indicators, which are in any case much, much superior to those of India. Uh, I don't know China's human development rank, but it's in the top 50. India, we're 126. Okay. In India, also, our, even our official poverty is much higher and more persistent. Currently, it's around <coughs> 24 to 28 percent of the population, depending on how you measure it. We did reduce it, but we also changed our definitions when we were reducing it. <laughs> so it's always a good way to, to get lots of less poor people. Um, and also our provision of essential public services has been pathetic, to say the least. Extremely inadequate. What is worse is that over the last 10-15 years, when GDP has been rising so much, the actual public spending on, public, on these essential things like health and so on has fallen in per capita. So it's really a huge comparison in terms of, you know, the basic provisions of uh, economic and social rights. So government health spending is still very low, education spending is still very low, nutrition spending is inadequate, and so on and so forth. And all of these, of course, in turn, leave you different human development indicators. Despite all these differences, and I'm going to be a bit self-contradictory, I'm going to say that there are still, in fact, important similarities between these countries. And the similarities are not just in terms of the good news, which everyone knows, so I'm not going to keep talking about the good news. They're also in terms of the bad news and the things to watch out for. We really face very similar problems in many ways. We have to change our growth strategy, both of us. 
people talk about this a little bit more in the Chinese case. That you know, you have, it can no longer rely on this very high export, high accumulation, high investment strategy that you know is based on constantly increasing shares of global markets and suppressing domestic consumption. Because you keep consumption shares down, right, if you're investing so much on GDP. What they did after the global crisis is that they basically relied on a debt finance boom to get out of it. The Chinese package, the stimulus package, everyone talks about how large it was, and suddenly it was a huge package. It was larger than Obama's rescue package. But it also involved a massive increase in indebtedness. So indebtedness levels have doubled or almost tripled in China. Then it's now estimated, the latest estimate is it's around 284% of GDP, total debt to GDP ratios. And indebtedness has increased in every sector of the economy in households, in provincial governments, <coughs> in companies, among banks, because of the whole shadow banking nexus. So it's, it's an unsustainable pattern. There will have to be deleveraging, and there will have to be a shift away from, a, a kind of rebalancing away from exports to the domestic market. Now this is usually associated in most economies with a decline in GDP rates, growth, growth rates. But GDP growth, rapid GDP growth has become a bit of a political tiger that the Chinese state has written for a while. It's a bit, you know, that we, we offer you high GDP, now keep your mouth shut about other stuff, you know. Uh, there, is a, there is an issue with a, a rebalancing unless it is managed in a way that ensures that actually wage employment uh, things keep rising in, in sustainable ways. But India also has many problems in terms of the particular growth pattern. And it's not just for obvious reasons that it hasn't generated employment and so on. But recent growth, the fact that we were this you know, 6 to 7.5-8% GDP uh, economy, that recent growth was also based on debt. But it was a different kind of debt. It was debt mainly to the corporate sector. And it was debt based on the fact that the government wanted investment. So it pushed commercial banks. Remember, 65% of the commercial banking system is under the state. We killed our development banks. We got rid of them in the 90s. So then we had to use the commercial banks to do long-term investment. So the commercial banks were made to invest in infrastructure, electricity, aviation, you know, very long-term investments. And now they're all saddled with bad debts, which in fact is giving them a high non-performing loan ratio, and so they're unwilling to lend more. The companies that are sitting on this huge burden of debt are unwilling to invest more. And so you have to do something now to actually get back or do a proper growth strategy. It's not just investment rates that have been falling in India. Real investment has been falling in absolute terms, in constant prices over the last four years. People can't believe this. They say, no, no, you're growing at 7%. Your investment must be growing. It isn't. Okay. That's just one of the big concerns. The second big concern is inequality. I think this one people know about. Because we have the richest billionaires. We have fewer billionaires than China, but ours are richer. <laughs> they are even richer than Chinese riches, apparently. Although I think Jack Ma has just beaten Mr. Ambani, so I'm not sure. Anyway, um, uh, so we have the biggest inequality in terms of assets. And the pattern of growth is one that has actually generated much more inequality. So we have all these richest billionaires and so on, and we also have in India the greatest amount of absolute degradation. It's always bizarre to find that our Gini coefficient is lower than that of China. Because the Chinese absolute base minimum is like double the lowest base minimum in India in terms of, it, you know, in terms of the bottom 10%. But, um, and also China measures income rather than consumption, so the Gini would be higher. Nonetheless, it is the case that in both countries, inequality has grown dramatically and has created inevitably unpleasant societies with all kinds of other problems that I will talk about in a minute. And it's also becoming socially unacceptable. But employment is a huge challenge as well. Well, for India it's a huge challenge for the obvious reason that I had just given you. I just showed you how we are not able to, to move people into to good jobs. But even in China, job quality, new job quality is not meeting rising aspirations. 
And this is often a surprise to people who think that everybody is rushing into all these, you know, export-oriented zones and making more and more toys and whatever, and you know, and, and silicon chips and solar uh, power <coughs> cells and all of that. In fact, manufacturing employment in China has been falling in absolute number. Okay, it's service employment that is growing, and among the young, the service employment is of a kind that you're all getting familiar with. It's short term, it's precarious, it's often you know, more or less piece rate work, like in courier services. Uh, it's, uh, it's fragile, it's uh, insecure. So a lot of the employment generation is also not of a quality that is desired by you know, those who are able to work. And then, of course, there is environmental sustainability. It's, there are huge effects on economic growth on not just climate change, that's the one everyone talks about, but it's not just climate change. In, in our countries, inside our countries, what we really feel is the pollution, environmental and water pollution, the degradation of natural resources, and the over-exploitation of resources. You know, soil quality is declining in both our countries, and, and all kinds of other ways in which we are destroying nature, and it's not going to affect us in the future, it's affecting us today, already. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on both of these, uh, on all of these in a little, if you don't mind. But let me begin with Chinese growth patterns. You know, um, one of the reasons why it has to change, okay, so this is the, the oh dear, I'm sorry, I didn't realize they're all the same color. <laughs> ah, the brown line, the curve that's going up, the inverted U. That's the GDP growth, which as you see is, um, oh no, sorry, that's the investment rate which is very, very high. The red line is the GDP growth, which as you see is coming down. Now, one of the things that is remarkable here is that the GDP growth started coming down even while the investment rate was still very, very high, which is telling you that the efficiency of that investment was coming down. You needed more and more investment to generate, you know, the additional increase of output. It's not such a great thing in that sense. It's, it's a, Mind you, everybody talked about how China has to rebalance and all that. Well, it has rebalanced in the sense that it is bringing its investment rates down. It is trying to increase consumption. There is a slight, as I said, you can see that there's a decline since 2011 in the investment rate. But the current account and the current account balance also came down very significantly. Okay? Uh, so China did, in fact, rebalance even externally. However, since 2011, the current account balance has started rising again. And it's rising not because exports are going up. In fact, exports have not been rising very much in China. They have been falling in certain years. But imports have fallen even faster. Now, that's really bad news for the rest of us who are all basing our expansion on exporting to China in terms of raw materials and intermediates. But that is actually the way it's worked. I'm not sure how much this is very clear, but you know what you can see, I told you that household consumption has actually uh, gone up slightly. So this is a very long time series. This is going from the turn of the century, turn of the millennium, 1999 onwards. The blue dotted line is household consumption, okay? which as you can see fell through all those boom years as a share of national income. So household consumption as a share of income falling dramatically when it was already quite low compared to other countries, okay? In India at 65%, here it was 45%, it fell to 35%. I mean, really a big decline. And it has started to recover. Since 2011, there's an increase in the share of household consumption. So yes, there's a bit of rebalancing. But look at that gray line, which is profits. Profits as a share of GDP dip from 40% they fall to about 35%, but then they zoom massively, as you can see. There's this massive expansion in the prof. The right hand side, sorry, that's not, uh, it's the, the axis is on the right hand side for profits, okay? So it's going from about 24% um, to 20% and then going up to about 34% in its peak, but then, since 2010, we don't have a complete series, but when we have a complete series, we find that it's, it's gone down significantly, it's been squeezed. Profits have been squeezed. Two things going on here. One, yes, wages are going up. But two, in 
fact, because of the much more precarious global situation, in fact, Chinese producers are reducing their profit margins to keep their external markets. Because you have, you, you know, your global exports are falling, you have to somehow keep your market shares. You may not even expand them, but at least keep them. So they're actually taking lower prices and squeezing their profits to maintain their market shares. The wage, as you can see, fell in that period when household consumption fell, but real wages have been rising in the recent past. And that's what has made many people say, look, China has now reached that newest turning point. You all remember that from your undergraduate textbooks, right? That uh, basically, at some point, the supply of surplus labor will give out, and therefore, to actually generate more income, you will have to get higher wages. It's all very good and positive, and you know, the best for everybody can do that. And it looks, in some ways, as if that's the case, because the left hand uh, part of this is actually the real wages. And you can see that these urban wages only, again, these have been going up continuously over the last few years. The last year here is 2016. So definitely, real wages are going up. But wait a minute. There are many bars in this, right? It's not all columns. It's not just one wage. The highest one is the state wage, the state-owned enterprises. Okay? And that's the highest wage, and that's also the one with the highest increase. The middle one is private employers in urban China, which share has been increasing very significantly. Okay? Private employers are becoming more and more important. I'll show you that in a minute. And the last column is the migrant workers who are not recognized as urban residents, they don't have a hukou, and therefore a lot of the, you know, the urban resident rights. But nonetheless, uh, they, some, some municipalities are now recognizing them. But mind you, even their wages are going up. But if you look at the right-hand column, you will see that the ratio of the migrant wage to the state-employed wage went up for a while, but has collapsed thereafter. <coughs> so, how come? Migrant wages are not going on increasing if indeed it is a lowest turning point. You should actually get a convergence, not a divergence. Whereas you're getting a divergence. And as I mentioned to you, much more urban employment is now private and self-employed. This is the, the red line on the left side is the share of uh, urban employment in the state-owned enterprises. And the brown line shooting up is the share of urban employment or not share the absolute numbers in millions of urban employment in private and self-employed individuals. Now, this is very unusual in China, to have self-employed individuals. I mean, we're very used to it in India. We could tell them a lot about that. But it's really expanding in China. And those of you who have any notion of what it's like to be a self-employed individual will know about all the fragilities, all the facts that most of the time what you're doing is really peace-rate work and that you take on all of the risks and costs and burden of production and get very little of the advantages. Nonetheless, that's the employment that is really increasing in China. And the same thing is happening in manufacturing, which is the right-hand side of this. This is the urban manufacturing employment, and as you can see, the state-owned enterprises collapsed from the mid-90s onwards, when they did the reform of state-owned enterprises, and the private employment in manufacturing has gone up. And as I told you already, the recent growth is based on these unsustainable debt burdens. So every single sector of the economy has increased its debt, and the aggregate debt is now really quite uh, enormous relative to GDP. And that has a bad side. That that's telling you that you need more and more debt. Not only do you need more and more investment to produce output, but you need more and more debt to produce output, which is really not desirable, right? So the pre-crisis average, before the, the big stimulus and all that, you needed about 1.2 units of credit for additional unit of GDP as the long-term trend. Thereafter, you need nearly 3, 2.8 times the credit to generate the additional unit of output. That's bad news. For sure, that's a sign of a bubble. And of course, as I mentioned, the inequalities, they're coming down, but they're still really quite high. Okay. Now let's look at India. We are, of course, now supposedly the first or second, depending on which week you look at it, uh, fastest growing economy in the world. 
So it's higher, it's slightly slower than before, actually, on average, if you're looking at the recent period. In terms of, these are the years, okay? But if you look at it in terms of quarters, we actually find a significant deceleration. It's been coming down every quarter since the, um, since the uh, middle of 2016, okay? So it's coming down continuously. And this is despite the fact that our GDP data do not actually capture the impact of demonetization, which is another new story we can go into subsequently, if we have time. But what is worse is that this very rapid growth was actually very wrongly composed, if you like. Most of it was due to these two things. Fire, which is finance, insurance, and real estate, and government spending on public administration and defense. So if you look at the entire period between 2011-12 and 2016, you find that 40% of the growth was only in these two sectors. Now, if I come to an economy where I'm told that you know about 26% of the growth is fire and the rest, a large part of it is, is public administration, I'm saying, oops, this looks like a bubble to me. This is a very pre-crisis kind of growth. I can go blindfolded to any number of countries that have had financial crisis, and I will find this pattern of growth, dominated by fire and government spending. So it's now a cause of concern. As I mentioned, investment is languishing. It's fallen to less than 30% of GDP from around 34%, and it's even falling in cost of price terms. So it's really, really declining, okay? If you look at just the last two quarters, where, mind you, we got this big whammy of demonetization, of course, but it was fundamentally based on agriculture because we had a really good monsoon after three years of drought and public spending, public administration and defense. But, wait a minute. Okay, so then we would assume that spending on public sector and agriculture things should be good. For the last three months across the country, we've had massive farmers' protests. I don't know how much the, the media here is capturing it, but farmers in almost every state have been protesting because prices have crashed to the point where they cannot cover their costs and they certainly can't pay off any loans. Okay? Now, why is this happening? Part of it is because the internal demand is completely demolished by the whole demonetization uh, factor, but also it's because there's nothing else for farmers to do. There is not enough other activity, there's not enough other employment that has been generated structurally. So people are stuck in this farming that is increasingly unviable. And public spending, which is the other thing that is supposed to have given us growth, well then where is it? Are we seeing it in more health spending, more education spending, more spending on the employment scheme, more spending on nutrition, on the Food Security Act? No, all of these are actually coming down in spending as a share of GDP. So where's this government consumption? What does it actually consist of? It's a mystery to us as well. I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> now, the other story, the reasons why India is so peculiar, it's not just the absence of structural change. It's also that you know, total employment has stagnated. And look at that. That's the total. Rural plus urban. Rapid growth. I'm sorry the data ended in 2011-12. I wish I could give you more recent data. I will once the government gives us more recent data. Uh, unfortunately, all we have is till then, but what we can see is that even in that period of very rapid growth, aggregate employment doesn't increase. And mind you, this includes all kinds, fragile, insecure, self-employed, part-time, you, you name it, everything. You milk a cow once a day, you do nothing else all day, you are regularly employed, according to our data. <laughs> Seriously, I think mean, that's the definition. Okay? So, Organized sector employment. Now again, Kuzmets, etc., assumed that rapid growth and all of these things is going to give you more organized sector employment. But no. Public employment is flat. Once again, the data ends in 2011-12, I'm sorry. Private employment increased slightly, but overall it's a tiny, these are the absolute increases. These are tiny, tiny, tiny increases. So the total organized sector employment is under 30 million people. Our workforce is touching 500 million people. You get a sense of where we are. Now, okay, so organized is only 30 million people. But wait a minute, everybody in organized, even if you're in the formal sector, 
where shares are falling. This is, of course, part of what's happening all over the world. Everywhere where shares are falling, but also in India. So don't think that, oh, you know, India China doing very well and the wage shares going up. No, our wage shares also falling, even in the organized sector. We're not even beginning to get into what's happening to the informal sector. But the informal sector dominates the Indian labor market. Okay? I told you that 30 million only are in organized sector. So uh, that's about 15% of the population. But all of them are not formal sector workers. Now, we actually have a very generous definition of what a formal sector worker is. You have to have any one of the three. You have to have either a written contract or any kind of social security, pension or anything, or paid leave. Not and, or. Any one of those, and you get called a formal sector worker. Despite this wonderfully generous definition, guess how many workers are formal in India? 4% of the workforce. Okay? Why is that? Because even in the public sector, around a quarter, 23% of the workers are in informal contracts. The subcontracted, the daily wage, the casual, and so on. And more than half of the workers in the private organized sector are informal, have no protection. Informal basically means no protection, nothing, okay? So 96% of the workforce is informal. Just to give you a, a sense of the, you know, the overall thing, make in India is what our Prime Minister says and so on, organized manufacturing has got less than 14 million employees, okay? And of course India is the software capital of the world and maybe office of the world, etc. Total IT services employment. Okay, total, which is to say software services, BPO, everything. Total employment around 3 million. Okay, workforce around 500 million. And that's because many of the, the reason it's a low workforce is because a lot of women are not classified as working. We'll come into that. <laughs> so, as you can see, big share of informal workers in non agricultural act, organized activities. It's going up a lot in the public sector as they do all the kinds of things which you also in England face. The outsourcing that gives you terrible work contracts and so on, even in the public sector. And in the private sector it's come down slightly, but from a very high level. It used to be at 60%, now it's 54%. Nonetheless, it gets less and less share of the national income. The unorganized sector, 85% of the workforce and only Oh, less than 50, about 57% of national income when we have the data, which is for 2009. Now, since then, there have been all these attacks on informal activity. So that share would have come down even further. Um, but the people who are stuck in it are still stuck in it because formal employment is not going up. So it's not just that overall structurally we did this to the informal sector. But now we are doing even worse things through policy. That is to say, as if you know, God and everybody else was not being bad enough to the informal sector, now government policy is also attacking the informal sector. I already mentioned agriculture and the viability of farming. But demonetization was essentially an attack on the informal sector. It was expressed as an attack on poverty, on you know, counterfeiting of loans, and so on and so forth. In fact, it, I'm sorry, on uh, corruption. I, I, as an attack on corruption and counterfeiting, it did nothing for any of that, but it really attacked informal activities. It basically created a payments crisis and a complete collapse of liquidity that affected the functioning and is still affecting the functioning. But now we have another one coming on, which is the goods and services tax, which is again being presented even in the foreign media as this wonderful new reform that is going to kind of change and transform the Indian economy and make it a single market and so on. Now, it's very strange to hear GST being represented as a sort of neoliberal reform. Because we already have a VAT system, but it varied across states and so on. There are many countries, in fact, it's only a minority of countries in the world that have GST. And they're usually unitary countries. The US doesn't have GST. But I don't hear anyone jumping up and down and saying, you know, without GST, the US economy will never grow and so on. So we have GST. It's supposed to be a single unitary tax. It's got five different rates. And nobody can figure out which rate is what. So, you know, a household wood is, let's say, 18%, but a rubber wood is 15%. What happens when it's a rubber household wood? Nobody knows. They can't tell you. So, 
then everybody, including small and micro enterprises, has to fill in these forms. Just to register, you have to fill in 17 forms. Now, every month, you have to fill in about five forms, every quarter, another form, and every year, another very large form. Imagine this happening to tiny enterprises with four or five people or one person. Imagine them having to fill in all these forms. Obviously, you hire an accountant, which adds to your costs. In addition, you have to pay the staff, which will add to your costs. Then you have to wait to get reimbursed, which you may or may not, depending on whether your suppliers have paid their tax. And essentially, you go under. This is another way of more or less eliminating the informal sector, the final solution, if you like. Uh, for getting rid of informality. Now, I want briefly, I don't know, I've taken too long already, but could I just talk about generalism? Because it's an aspect of inequality that I think is, is very important in understanding certainly India, but also now China. Now, in fact, you know, gender equality, inequality in India is rampant, but in general, gender discrimination is, is pretty much integral to accumulation and economic growth in many countries, in most countries of the world, and certainly in capitalism generally. Because of the fact that you know it allows all kinds of advantages for employers. It allows the entry and exit of into the labor force based on you know your lifestyle, your culture, where you are in your life cycle. Once you want to have babies, you move out to work and that kind of thing. It creates segmented labor markets, so you get cheaper labor for similar work. You know, women's reservation work, labor, work wage is typically lower. And of course, there's a huge role of social reproduction. I mean, Diane is sitting here, so you will all know about it. The, the kind of role played by the care sector, the care economy, that helps families to cushion uh, not just crises, but in general to cover the entire range of things that societies need to carry on. It's fascinating to see that even in China, women's workforce participation rate is falling. It's one of the few countries in the world. China and India are among the few countries in the world where women's workforce participation rates have fallen over the last two decades. And it's quite a sharp, dramatic decline in China. And it essentially suggests that they are reverting to more traditional economic roles, which essentially means providing unpaid labor in the household. But even in India, and in India it's even more striking and sharper because in India our workforce participation was already incredibly low. The left side of it was, will, is the male and female, the upper line is male. It, that, even that is low by global standards, about 56 to 58 percent. But the female is crazy. It starts out at about 30 percent and ends up at 24 percent. In a period when GDP is growing from 7 to 10 percent, this is unheard of. I have not found a single other example anywhere in the world where the economy is growing so rapidly and it's falling this tiny amount. And as you can see, the next side tends uh, side to urban and rural. The big decline was in rural. Okay, that was the big decline. Uh, and it was mostly women self-employed in agriculture and so on. Urban didn't decline, but that's because it was already so low that there was nothing to decline from. Yeah, 15% I mean, come on. How can you get less than 15% workforce participation? So in both countries, what are you getting? You're really getting a shift from paid to unpaid labor. Okay? In China, there's a, a shift to a focus on domestic care and you know, social reproduction and so on, especially in, in the middle and upper income groups. And there's a, a lot more, uh, many of my friends in China tell me about a much greater social kind of um, pressure for women to be part of a more patriarchal pattern of uh, not just behavior, but what you expect to do in life and what kind of person you expect to be with and whether you will be self-supporting or dependent on the husband's income and so on. And of course, you know, the, the opposite also, right? The number of young men who told me they can never get married because they can't buy the flat. And they have to buy a flat. It's not a couple together. You know? So that kind of thing. But in India, the big increase, and we have data that actually shows it, we have data that captures what is called domestic duties as well as a whole range of activities like collecting firewood and water, okay, which are essential in the rural areas. That has actually massively increased. So, in fact, there is a shift from, unpaid to, uh, from paid to unpaid labor. So, women, if you look at the, the proportion of women who are doing all this work put together, 
that is those who are in the paid workforce as well as those who are doing the entire care economy, social reproduction, as well as collecting flowers, water, etc., etc. 85% of women in India are working, not 24%. Slight difference out there. What does it mean? It basically means that you know this is a huge subsidy to the recognized economy because it's always unpaid labor that is simply not recognized or remunerated or anything. But it also completely messes up your aggregate productivity calculations because you are underestimating the number of workers in the economy. Okay, finally, just on the pollution aspect, which is a big issue, as you know, uh, any of you who has traveled to either Beijing or Delhi in the recent past will know what I'm talking about. And it's one of the things that does, um, you know, uh, get a lot of global press. But as you can see, uh, the deaths due to atmospheric pollution, that's the chart on the left, China and India now we account for half of the global deaths due to atmospheric pollution. And of course, death is just the extreme form where you can define that it was because of this and not a heart attack. But there are all kinds of other in, in, in respiratory illnesses, you know, strokes, asthma, cancer. I, I recently lost my sister-in-law to cancer that was apparently related to pollution and so on. So the, what is remarkable is that it's not confined to the metros. It's actually often even more intense in smaller towns and cities and in very urban and semi-urban areas. So it is a huge, huge issue. But it's also not just atmospheric, it's water pollution. And water pollution is very, very big. You know, people say that, oh, India and China together have the, uh, out of the 20 most polluted cities, we have all of them, right? But out of even the top 50 polluted cities in terms of atmospheric pollution, we have most of them. But hey, even in water, we're tops. We have the most cities with polluted water bodies. We have the most, I mean, in, in the Chinese case, there are also other non-pollution issues. You know, there's salinity, water logging, etc. from these massive irrigation projects. Um, and of course, there's massive, massive pollution, <coughs> lakes or rivers and so on. And there's much more conflict about these. Okay, um, there are there all the reports, including from Chinese officials, that told me that there are around 50,000 protests every year about water. So people are increasingly seeing, because you know water is essential for human life, right? If you cannot drink the water, you can't eat the fish that are coming from your nearby river, it's a problem. Okay? In India, water shortage is a huge, huge problem. Uh, we've had uh, drought in many areas. It's massively increasing the time spent to collect water. People have to dig deeper and deeper to get groundwater. And it's, it's becoming a, a real source of conflict, intra-group uh, and intra-community conflict as well. But in our case, organic and bacterial water pollution dominates. And a lot of it is because of the discharge of both human and domestic, but also industrial waste into our water bodies, mostly untreated. And again, that's the problem about unplanned urbanization, that in our smaller towns and cities, it's generally untreated, even in our mega cities, a lot of it is untreated. And again, the obvious links to mobility and mortality, which I will not uh, emphasize. Two pictures from China and India. Uh, they're both rivers, believe it or not. And they're both froth. It's toxic froth that happens when the chemicals in the water catch fire. And this is happening in a rural area in China on the left, and in the city of Bengaluru, the software capital of India on the right. It's, a, it's an urban river which opens out into a very big urban lake, the largest lake in Bengaluru, which periodically catches fire. And so when it catches fire, all these, it's not just the, the, the river and the water which is dangerous, but the fumes that this fire generates makes it impossible to breathe in that area. And this is regular, it's normal, it's not something that has just happened once. It keeps happening. So what's going on? I think what's happening is basically that what we've got is, yes, a lot of success, but it's success based on an accumulation strategy that is essentially neoliberal. What do I mean by that? I mean that it privileges GDP growth rather than quality of life, and it assumes that that GDP growth will be given by large capital and debt-based cycles, and the hope is that all of this will trickle down to everybody else at the bottom. Okay? And just as in the advanced countries where, in fact, there is now anger, resentment, and even fury at all of these things, I think the same strategy 
actually it's generating similar kinds of inequality, insecurity, worse conditions of life, and people are also getting angry. And uh, it's getting, uh, the difference is perhaps that what you're getting, well, maybe not a difference, you're getting very unpleasant social responses. In India, we're having a rise of communal tension, caste-based tensions, gender violence, and so on. In China, you're getting a lot more, it's a less socially discriminatory society, so you're getting more protests of different kinds. But in both cases, definitely there is evidence of public unhappiness, resentment, anger about all of these. So essentially what I'm arguing is that we have to change strategy, both of us. We need not a trickle-down, but a bubble-up strategy, as Minsky used to call it. One that is based on good quality employment growth that creates domestic demand and multiplier effects, recognizes the significance of the care economy with the universal provision of good public services, and doesn't rely on these debt-based cycles. Now, I have more on how we could do it, but I think that would take far too long, and maybe we could take that up in the questions. So, thank you all very much. Yeah, I think that was truly wonderful, a real tour de force which covers such a lot of ground um, with extraordinary evidence, both quantitative and qualitative. And I think some of those pictures at the end really brought home what we are looking at here. So we've now got um, around 20 minutes for some discussion, for some questions and answers from the audience. And I think what I'll do is take them in groups of about three, if that's all right. So, so we'll get a a range of questions. Some might also come from our online audience, so please, if you'd like to ask something, please just put it in the comment, in the comment box. Sorry, we've got some. Okay, lovely. Um, and if you could just put your hand up, um, we will have a rolling mic so you can be heard. So anybody who'd like to start. Okay, so Hannah here at the front. Is this from our Online this is on behalf of our online audience. So thank you to Martin House, who actually asked two questions. Um, so the first one were, what effects do you expect from the recent liberalisation for FDI in India? And the second one was, what do you think are the effects of the underperformance of the Indian system of education, especially in primary and secondary education on the economy and the democracy? Okay, that's great. Let's take perhaps one or two from the audience here. So, Stephanie. Um, well, thank you very much for a really brilliant presentation. Um, I would like to ask precisely what you finished with is, could you give us some hints, particularly for India, on how you see the structural transformation in India, and perhaps a little bit on, on the instruments that you Maybe one more in this round, yes, in the middle there. Actually, perhaps if people could just introduce themselves as well when they ask their question. That would Hi, be great. Um, it's Neil Kemp. I was previously in government, I guess. Um, a, a couple of areas around population. We're going to see quite dramatic change over the next 10 years as the demographic um, change in China begins to impact on the labour force with the one child policy beginning to have its biggest effect. And in India, we're getting a bit of a population bulge that's going through the um, uh, employment age. How do you see that interacting over the next 10 years? And, and related to the education, I found you to be quite fascinating what you had to say about female, female participation in the, in, in the labour market, particularly as in both countries we've seen a marked increase in female participation rate in both secondary and higher education, so we would have expected a different sort of change to that one we were suggesting. Thank you. Okay, well that's that's quite a quite a range. Let's let yes. you get started on those. Good, yeah. it. Thank you very much. Yes, to Martin. Well, thanks very much for the question, Martin. Questions, I should say. The recent liberalisation of FDI. What will it do? Nothing. We've actually got wonderful rules for FDI already. We're giving pretty much everything, anything you want, everyone, anyone wants. We've even liberalized now in terms of you know, military hardware spending and so on. We're trying to even encourage, which I don't think any other country will do, to encourage FDI to come in. But they don't come. 
Basically, we're throwing a party, everyone's attending, despite the parents. <laughs> and I think that has to do with the, the other issues, the fact that you need good infrastructure, you need a well-trained, healthy workforce, you need your know, lack of congestion and pollution and all of these things before you get uh, and you need a, a buoyant domestic market, which is a genuinely buoyant one, not one based on a, a bubble of insurance and so on, so, and, and the finance. So, so immediate impact of any of those liberalisation measures zero, I'm afraid. On the issue of um, education, and I, I'm going to take Neil's question along with uh, this underperformance of education in India. You know, it's. It is remarkable. It's remarkable that yes, we're getting a much more increase of women in uh, in education, and now we have pretty much universal education for women uh, up to primary school. And in general, when they make it to the end of their school, they always outperform the the boys in the final school exam and so on. Nonetheless, we are not finding equivalent increase, except for a very small category in in the labor force. And this has to do, I believe, with the fact that it's really, it's not just the uh, you know, social conditions, it is that these, the patriarchal attitudes towards and the gender construction of society that puts the entire burden of unpaid care on women within a household has permeated even the government. So there's a huge attitude even to care services. The government provides good services to women, uh, on the basis of underpaid women who are not given even the minimum wage. They get like a third or a quarter of the minimum wage. Because they're not called workers, they're called helpers or activists, right, ashas. And the reason you can get away with this is because of this notion that women's work is, I mean, you know, what all that stuff is anyway going to be done for free inside the home, so they're lucky if you get a little bit of, you know, a little bit extra on the side. So it's a deeply patriarchal attitude which has so far benefited capitalist accumulation, it's been a huge subsidy. So, you know, there's no incentive on, on the state to actually, and, and the state is riddled with it. If I have met women joint secretaries who tell me, yeah, why should we pay them a minimum wage? You know? So, it's, it's, it's very marked and strong. Um, in terms of the underperformance of education, I think it's terrifying. I think the two aspects of education which are of great concern, as you probably know, most of our schooling is now increasingly private. And the government is also pushing more and more private schools. So more than half is now private. But if we have these surveys of educational outcomes. And the remarkable thing is that the public sector and the private sector are equally bad. I mean, class 5 students cannot read a class 2 text or do basic division, okay? Whether you're in public school or private school. <laughs> Certain states are better than others, but not otherwise. Um, the demographic bulge therefore becomes an even bigger issue. I mean, it's a huge concern. People talk about the dividend. To me, it's a time bomb. It's terrifying because if you have a huge bunch of young people without prospects, with very fragile outcomes, many of whom have spent a lot of family income on assets on privatized tertiary education and cannot get jobs, I think the social implications are terrifying. So I find it actually a cause of big concern. I think in China they're much better off. I think they're already conscious of the need to, to you know, change infrastructure and facilities and amenities for, um, for older people and the ability to use older people in different ways. And of course they relax the one child norm now so they will once again get a recovery of the replacement rate. So I think they are much they are much better at handling, partly because they are still a planning economy, unlike us. They are much better at handling the demographic change, I believe. Stephanie, that's a very big question. I'm going to do it rapidly in terms of some of the things that I had suggested. Public provision of infrastructure, amenities, basic services. Okay, based on revenue raising in progressive ways. I mean, obviously. Employer of last resort with an emphasis on good quality employment generation, and it should be in all kinds of activities that improve the quality of life, especially social services and care work, which must be treated as good quality work. And of course, this does all, and it's, so it's both regular and casual, because it also has very strong multiplier effects, you know, that whole bubble up thing. So that you see wage bills as a source of effective demand, not just as a cost. 
a focus on micro, small, and medium enterprises. Everything is oriented to large capital. Micro enterprises, it's a miracle they survive at all. They don't get access to banks. They, you know, I mean, everything is against them, really. Terrible infrastructure and so on. And now they're being hit continuously by these policy measures. So that has to be reversed. Factoring in environmental costs and outcomes in every policy that we do, which we haven't done so far. Universal good quality public provision, I would say. Wonderful. Well, I'm pleased one's getting to this yeah. long list of how things could be different, but major barriers to that, of course. Let's take another round. So again, we have another yeah. another online question. So if we can come back to Anna here at the front. Um, so this is from Annie James. Um, and it, I think it's two parts to this question. So how might one mobilise informed public action to A, counter the propaganda the Indian government have around a better economy, and B, support more equitable growth that focuses on the marginalised, given that government spending on public services is only coming down, so that seems to be a lost cause. Um, and Annie says, while these are broad questions, it would be good to know your thoughts as possible actions around these kind of areas. So just go behind to Francis there, and then I'll be looking for some questions from the back, so please be ready. That was a great lecture, very stimulating. There's a puzzle which I have in my mind, and I really have seen this, people say, and you've said that the debt is a huge problem for China. Now I accept in a capitalist economy where we handicap ourselves by having all sorts of rules about monetary mm. creation and so on, that debt is a real problem. I don't understand it in a planned economy. It seems to me the government could, if it wanted, deal with the debt situation in a variety of ways. I won't go into all the different ones, but I cannot see that it has to be this big problem that, you know, you're not alone. Everyone, the FT every day, if China is so fragile because of the debt. And then at the back here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Samuel. I'm a master student at Global, Global Safety Business and Development at IDS. And so you mentioned the decrease in the share in manufacturing employment. And so since this happens at much lower income levels than in many Western countries, I want to ask you if you think if the uh, Indian service sector is able to make up and grow up enough um, to like to uh, make up for these pre-mentioned industrialization, can the service sector replace? The manufacturing group. Okay. Is so there one more in this round? I can just this thing. Yes. What about over here? And then we may be, that may be as far as we can go in the form of discussions. Yeah. Hi, uh, um, my name is Matt Williams. I'm uh, yeah, studying the MA Gender and Development. Uh, I'm doing my dissertation on uh, the universal basic income trial that was recently run in India, um, I know you spoke quite a bit about economic insecurity um, and female employment rates. I was just wondering what you thought about universal basic income as a possible policy. Okay, that's another big road. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I now have to discipline myself to try and keep short on this. But um, Annie, thank you very much. Those are tough questions, I have to confess. How do we mobilize public opinion to what's going on? You know, it's so difficult. I mean, it's true that the, the global press is raving, but so is the Indian media. It's completely subservient at the moment to the government. And it's, you know, the, the pockets of isolated, rational kind of thinking in the, in the media are really tiny and they are being attacked. And it is also the case that even NGOs that are, you know, trying to raise the voice of anybody working for human rights is, is under attack very systematically. So it is a tough time, and there's no question about it. I think greater awareness abroad would definitely help. I think uh, you know, it, this is a government that is very conscious of its external image. And uh, it, it's very proud of the fact that it has you know, apparently recovered you know, India's standing in the world, and this whole macho thing about how we are now growing and so on. So it's very important to have it has helped us in the past that when we can actually get more in Western media or in Western public discussion, Northern public discussion, about the tremendous, not just inequities, but uh, the, uh, the trampling of human rights at different levels that is occurring in India. And I think, I, I mean, you know, we need all the help we can get, I would say, at this point. Um, how do we do the broader shift in public services? 
Well, you know, I am still an optimist about India. Uh, John Robinson in Cambridge used to say that whatever you can say about India, the opposite is also true. <laughs> and and it's, it's true, you know, I mean, finally there are these terrible things I told you, but there are also these wonderful things of activists soldiering on in the midst of everything, doing all kinds of protests, managing to change things. And young people, my students inspire me a lot. Some of them are amazing. They are so much smarter than we were, and they need to be. You know, because it's really, it's a tougher world out there. But I think, I have, I really have faith that this is a passing phase and that we will be able to generate public momentum to, to change this. I do believe that Indian democracy in that sense is ultimately more vibrant, I hope. Um, Francis, you're absolutely right. It's a very, very uh, acute, astute question about debt. But you know, the, the problem is, that there is a bit of neoliberalism in the Chinese state. That's the problem. It would not be a problem if the Chinese state were just going to be the same old Chinese state of the past. But we have a very strong element within the state which is all for financial liberalization, all for deepening of financial structures, all for making renting be a global currency, allowing free capital flows, and etc. And they are the ones who will be deeply against any attempts for, a, let's say, to simply, you know, eliminate a lot of excess household debt and all of that kind of thing. So I think it's the political tension in China, which is a, a reasonably strong one, I think, that would prevent it from doing what a, a planned economy could do. So, and, and unfortunately, that is precisely the angle through which uh, a lot of the Western discussion is trying to move, by constantly saying, oh, now you must liberalize more because otherwise you're going to be stuck with this big debt problem. Now you need the discipline, and then you can bring in all the other things like fiscal austerity and so on. Uh, so I think it's that political tension which has created, if you like, the economic problem, which is why, in fact, it is better in, in a way in China. Samuel, um, can service sector replace manufacturing? Absolutely not. Can't work. In fact, the one significant insight that our Prime Minister had, Modi had about this was that we need manufacturing. We must do something about manufacturing. You can't just, you know, jump over to the next stage. As I told you, the developed service sector is tiny. And incidentally, China is soon, within five years, China will overtake India on all of these services. E-services, software, etc. Everything China will overtake India simply because their own domestic market is so large. And they are growing so rapidly on all of these. And also because all of the services also rely on a vibrant, there's a very strong kind of a synergy between manufacturing and services at more advanced levels of development. So uh, I think the previous government made a big mistake by ignoring this. The current government recognizes it, but it doesn't really have a good game plan to get manufacturing back. And that game plan necessarily requires more public investment, not public-private partnerships. So until we get a government that sees all of that, this is going to remain a problem. It's not a solution. Finally, oh UBI. Oh dear Matt, you know. <laughs> can I be quite, you know, so UBI is a remarkable thing. From its very inception, both the left and the right have championed mm. it, okay? It has been uh, um, something that has been, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, from whenever it started. We, Chanakya talked about it in the Arthashastra 5th century BC and so on. So it's been around for a while, the idea, okay? In a large number of developing countries today, it's a neoliberal project. Not in Europe, not in the US, but in developing countries, it's a neoliberal project. It is seen as something that will replace the public provision of essential social services. In India, we have that a government gun go all for it, let's do it. We'll get rid of food subsidy, this, you know, ed education spending, blah, blah, blah. We just give people money and let them go and do what they want with it. So it is a withdrawal of the state and a privatization of essential services. I am all for a UBI that actually adds to an expanded and more uh, effective public service delivery. I'm all for a UBI on top of that. A UBI that replaces it. And I don't know if you're working with Guy, but oh boy, I mean, he's being very dangerous in the Indian context. So it's not good to replace public services with a privatized delivery at effectively one tenth of the money cost. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I really feel I'm concerned about the way UBI. Uh, I think there are, there's a, there's a case for a UBI in addition to. 
But I, no way would I ever support a UBI that is a replacement for good quality, universal public service provision of all essential goods and services. And um, yeah, so it, it yeah. <laughs> So I think we've probably reached the end of our timing. I just wanted to say, I mean, to thank you again, Jayati, for what's been a hugely stimulating lecture. A couple of points sort of in conclusion. In a way, I think one of the other similarities between India and China as we read it, you began with the way that these are both held up as models of success. They're also, of course, both countries that are now trying to project that success onto a global stage as they themselves become development donors or leaders of international development cooperation, or in the case of China, through the Belt and Road Initiative, as it were, the vanguard of the new era of global development. And I think what you've shown us is a very salutary, alternative view of how we should be reading that success. What I also really appreciated in your talk, just about a year ago, we were in this very same lecture space in our IDS um, anniversary conference talking about state market society relations and where that balance lies in terms of progressive change that delivers reductions of poverty, greater equality, sustainability, security. And I think what you've shown us this evening is that the neoliberal push albeit taken forward in very different ways, is not the answer. And you've given us some very important clues, I think, both as to the problems in when the market takes over too strongly of a certain way, but also what one needs in terms of the bubbling up of state involvement and also of civil society involvement. Um, and finally, although I mean you've spoken tonight as an economist, as the world-renowned economist that you are, with super analysis, but also, I think, um, drawn in where power and politics and political economy, as well as what one might call social and cultural economy, come into play. So um, I think this has absolutely lived up to everything one could have hoped for in an IDS lecture. And please, all of you, join me in thanking JRT for a fabulous evening.